Welcome. Uh, my name is Maya Paradwaj with It Takes Roots, and I am really excited to welcome all of you to our online webinar, uh, Fonder Briefing for It Takes Roots, uh, focusing specifically on our Solidarity to Solutions Week or Soul to Soul. Um, so I'm I'm going to serve as moderator for this call, and I'm just going to let you know a little bit about what we'll be discussing today. Uh, so as it takes roots, we are an alliance of four alliances, Grassroots Global Justice, Climate Justice Alliance, the Indigenous Environmental Network, and Right to the City Alliance. And we represent uh, over 150 member organizations who are each doing local grassroots organizing and base building across the country and also internationally. Uh, so this year, um, in, in response and parallel to the Global Climate Action Summit and recognizing the, the intersectionality of the many issues that each of our member organizations work on, we are, we're coming together and preparing for a really big mobilization in September from the 8th to the 14th that we're calling the Solidarity to Solutions Week, or for short, Soul to Soul. Nice little bilingual play in English and Spanish on words there. Um, one of our members uh, came up with that who works out in the Bay. Um, so today on the call, we have about an hour and a half during which you'll hear from, you'll hear from us talking for about the first hour, so we'll have a good amount of time for questions. We'll start with hearing um, some introductions to and the history of It Takes Roots and our theory of change and how we see this Alliance of Alliances growing to really be a central place for movement building uh, long term. Uh, then we'll hear about why we're mobilizing around the Global Climate Action Summit and why that's a key flashpoint in the work that we're doing across sectors today. Um, we'll then hear from folks who are organizing on the ground um, both in the Bay Area, but also more widely across the US. So we'll hear examples from housing and land rights organizing, from environmental justice and climate justice organizing, and from a really wider example of people solutions and local solutions across the country. Um, we'll then run you through exactly what we're gonna be doing for that week of action, the, the Soul to Soul week, um, from the September 8th uh, up, and up through September 14th. And then we'll have a discussion with you all about ways to get involved. And you'll hear a little bit more from, from both the funding perspective as well as organizing at the national and local level. And then we'll have some time for questions and answers. We're, we're gonna be asking that everyone who's on the call who wants to ask a question, if you can type that into the chat box, that would be perfect. Um, we will have folks who are reading over the questions and trying to find where there are similar questions coming up. Uh, and then I will be reading them aloud to the panelists and, and they will be answering your questions in that format. So please make sure to type your questions into the chat. And if you wanna type your name, if you haven't uh, renamed yourself, uh, you, you're welcome to do that. And if you're joining over phone, um, if you can raise your hand, if you have a question closer to the end, I will be able to keep a look on that to be able to uh, try and call on you in that way as well. Um, great. So that is everything for what we're up to on this call today. Uh, and I am going to kick it over to our first presenter, Cindy Weisner, who's the National Coordinator of Grassroots Global Justice and also on the board of the Climate Justice Alliance to share more with us about the context, theory of change, and framing of It Takes Roots as an Alliance of Alliances. Thank you, Maya. I um, want to welcome folks um, onto this call. I know that there is a lot happening um, at this moment, I think in a lot, of it, and we, you know, we can't uh, start this call without um, understanding the, the huge uh, decision that was just made at the Supreme Court um, to uplift the Muslim ban, Trump's Muslim ban, and what's happening at the border and across the country with our migrant um, brothers and sisters, and, um, and the level of devastation that a lot of communities are, are really facing right now. Um, so um, 
Welcome everybody. My name is Cindy Weissner. I'm the National Coordinator with Grassroots Global Justice Alliance and we are very proud members of It Takes Roots um, collaboration and coalition with our sister alliances, uh, Right to the City Alliance, the Climate Justice Alliance, and the Indigenous Environmental Network. And I think that for us, um, given this uh, political moment, you know, um, I just want to share a little bit of history and, and backdrop uh, about our collaboration. And many of our alliances and movement leaders and mass-based organizations have been in relationship with each other, I would say, the past decade, decade and a half, um, you know, and being able to... Um, really build, I think, on a, on a lot of the relationships and trust and history that we have uh, with each other and for each other. We um, are coming together because we know that in this political moment, we need to aggregate our power, particularly the sector, the grassroots organizing sector in which we um, represent over 150 organizations um, in rural, urban, um, um, indigenous territories um, throughout the United States and also its, its, its colonies. Um, we are coming together, um, bringing forward our, our strengths in terms of our, our areas of work, our campaign work, but also really respecting the autonomy of each of the alliances because we all have a very particular role to play. We are um, bringing folks together um, that do work uh, across sectors, across uh, language, across race, across genders, across age, and really coming together um, to center the leadership of uh, and the power of frontline communities. And starting with indigenous people, Afro-descendant people, people of color, and other working class communities. And we are coming together to really fight against the violence of colonization, of white supremacy, of male supremacy, and of extractive economies. And we're also positioning ourselves to really uplift um, the alternatives and what we're needing. Um, we want to be uh, putting forward that transformative vision of a regenerative economy, um, healthy economies that are driven by the rights of protecting Mother Earth, of grassroots feminism, of systemic uh, transformation. And we're really rooted in the wisdom and place-based solutions um, and, and the practice and value of deep democracy. And so our vision is really, as it takes roots, is to build that deep um, political left alignment that's needed um, that's guided by vision, that begins to bring forward a platform that is centered and led by frontline communities to advance this visionary opposition um, and, and develop strategies that are so needed, not only to defend the environment, but to reclaim local governance and place-based power. And so for us, at this political moment, you know, we ask why we need this alignment why we need this visionary opposition. And it really is because of these colliding crises that we see, the crisis of climate, the crisis of economy, the crisis happening in terms of uh, race and gender, and the, crisis, and the crisis of democracy itself. And our communities have been feeling the impacts of Trumpism uh, from the gutting of environmental regulations, um, the denial of climate change, the fossil fuel driven economy, the housing crisis, the attacks on communities, um, like we're seeing um, in this past couple of weeks escalated. Um, and we really see an opportunity to impact um, the political landscape, um, especially from a local place-based perspective and lift up those uh, frontline led solutions. And so for us, it's a moment where we know we need to not only defend and protect, but we also need to, um, and we've been saying this a lot in this moment where it feels overwhelming and at times hopeless um, or confusing, that we need to dare to hope. And we need to dare to imagine and expand 
and really create the world we want to live in. And so we're very um, honored um, to be in this relationship with each other. We are deepening our our um, alignment with other sister alliances in this political period as well. And we're also part of being able to build out a vibrant and robust uh, you know, resistance movement. Um, the four alliances are also part of the majority, which is a black-led, people of color initiative that is coalition that is being built out. And we are uh, responding to this political moment um, with, with, in fact, the full happening in terms of the border um, and also the, the terrorizing of families at the border, but also across the country. And I think that it takes roots at the end in terms of our theory of change has given us an ability to bring the interest the voices, the leadership, the direct leadership of our members into this conversation, into moving strategies forward. And we um, also know that um, this is a moment to act in solidarity and to act um, with, uh, with our sisters and brothers that are under attack and at the same time uh, continue the deep organizing work and, and double down on the organizing. And I think if, it, if there's a lesson uh, in today's decision, it, it really is, um, and then throughout history, it is, it is the organizing, it is the movement building that will push back on the hate, will push back on the attacks. And I think that um, for us, It Takes Roots is a very um, important um, space of deepening our relationships with each other, de sh uh, sharing out um, that visionary platform, and at the same time, being able to build that that power base um, to push back. So I'm gonna uh, wrap up, and I'm gonna pass it on to my um, compañera, uh, Candy Masset, who is on the ground at the protecting, uh, setting the groundwork for the protecting Mother Earth um, convening that is happening. That a lot, thousand, you know, hundreds of people are coming, including um, it takes roots members and um, who's actually gonna share a little bit more about how we're all mobilizing around uh, in September, around the GCAS and our Soul to Soul Summit. So, Candy. Thank you, Cindy. That was a great um, opening and I appreciate that and the, the sharing of the struggles. So, Dosha, Margot, Marishima, Ishuria, Hetz. In my Herada language, I greeted you by saying, hello, my relatives. My name is Eagle Woman. My English name, or sometimes I say my colonized name, is Candy Masset. I'm Mandan Hiradza Rikara from North Dakota, and I've been with the Indigenous Environmental Network for 11 years now, and um, I'm just really excited to be a part of the entire It Takes Roots movement, the unity and strength that comes with the diversity of our, of our movement is just really powerful and really amazing. So... Um, there's a bunch leading up to the GCAS, the Global Climate Action Summit. It's not just, oh, there's this event happening and then we all go home. You know, we've had a direct action camp. We have this Protecting Mother Earth gathering here in the Pacific Northwest uh, near Olympia, Washington, this Wally territory, uh, where we're going to be talking about this summit and strategizing and organizing. And there are other meetings in July leading up to and through um, and it's a very, very significant time for, for everyone on, on a national level, on an international level around the strategies that are going to be planned um, within the Global Climate Action Summit and then without, uh, I mean, on the outside of the summit for the, the, the soul to soul, you know, the solutions to solutions. I'll get into that just a little bit, but first I want to talk about the problems that we're seeing with this Global Climate Action Summit that um, is happening in September in California. What we're seeing and what we've seen in the past with 23 United Nations um, framework conventions on climate change, where they've been meeting about what we're going to do about this climate crisis and about all of these problems that we have in the world, what we see is that people are often shut out. There are elected officials, there's business leaders that are brought in and they engage in all of what we call backroom deals around climate action. 
and um, it centers around the market and it leaves the us, the local people, our, our struggles and the solutions that we have as the people on the ground, living in our communities, living in extraction zones. I come from an area where they're drilling in the Bakken, um, which is the head of the snake uh, for the Dakota Access Pipeline. And I've seen firsthand the impacts to my community members. Um, it's just tearing us apart. It's tearing our culture apart. It's making us sick. And we see what we can do in our community. So when we look at the Global Climate Action Summit, we look at it as the World Trade Organization of the Sky. And I say that because it's a commodification of the sacred. These local elected officials, excuse me, I get so, when I talk about home, it, it, it's very hard for me. When we talk about these local elected officials, we shouldn't just be thinking of business and constituents. Um, there are big green organizations that are supporting this GCAS, but they have a his historically supported policies that just benefit the fossil fuel industry. And they're all invited, you know, they all have front row seats that can get in fairly easily. And yet it's very hard for us to register and get people and be a part of something. It's very limited spaces for what we're called, which is civil society. And there's an application process. There's no equity and engagement for like the mass people, us, that can make these changes. And so we're sort of just like there you know, in a pacified way, but shut out. And so in order to counteract that negativity that happens at something like the GCAS or at these large international meetings, we often have to have this outside strategy. And so we're not on the inside. We can't get on the inside. So what should we do about it? Well, thus enters the Solidarity, Solidarity to Solutions Week of Action, where we bring together our constituents. We have indigenous peoples, frontline communities from across the country and around the world to join the local California groups that have already been fighting with all of the pollution that's been happening there in California and all the poisoning that's been happening with all the refineries. And we're gonna to join together to make demands of these elected officials and stand up to the industry. We're not in a, in a back room somewhere making deals. We're out front and center. And we are saying, if you want to hear about supply and demand, well, listen to our demands. Don't just create your own supply that you think we need. As indigenous peoples, we have always said, we speak for ourselves. And that holds true across the entire It Takes Roots movement. We speak for ourselves, not these elected officials and people that are making backroom deals. We want to reinvest in, in, in the scale to our communities, in diversity, um, engage our global South leaders that have been having Te terrible failed climate policy schemes, things called RED and RED plus, carbon pricing, carbon trading schemes, um, schemes that go back to the Waxman and Markey bill. I, I testified in 2009 in front of Congress and talked about how we have so much uh, renewable energy potential in Indian country. In fact, four and a half times the amount that this country, the United States needs to power our energy needs we have right here in Indian country, and it's not being looked at for something for our good. It's being looked at as a commodity and how can it be bought, sold, and to the highest bidder and given out so that somebody else can make money. And it's in the, and it's in the arena of the fossil fuel industry. Um, we have such a diverse population, and it's just really, really important that people just realize that there's a, there's a conservative case for carbon dividends that just came out. It just got released um, by conservatives that people should read. And then you should go on our pages. Um, I know ienearth.org has the carbon pricing booklet that we have to give you the details. Because in a lot of these um, so-called solutions, the devil is in the details for what they're really trying to do, which is at the end of the day is make more money at the expense of our communities and our, our children, our people that are sick. I'm a cancer survivor. I had a stage four sarcoma tumor when I was 20. I shouldn't be sitting here telling you these things today, but I am. And I think it's because you need to hear it from us on the ground. Um, there are sustainable communities that have inclusive economic growth. We have land and ocean stewardship here in the Pacific Northwest. We have transformative climate investments that are grounded in climate action that really cares. Uh, yet you have this Paris Agreement 
it, you know, it continues to push human rights, indigenous sovereignty issues, race, and just transitions at its margins, but it's non-binding. <laughs> the most urgent and problematic thing is that we're not going to meet the 1.5 degrees Celsius targets that we need to survive on this planet. As long as these businesses and politicians and people that are out for the money portion continue making these decisions on our behalf, they're seeking investments and business solutions that are just popular. They're very short-sighted. They're not thinking seven generations ahead. Shoot, they're not even thinking two generations ahead, you know? It's like, what's this going to look like in a decade? You know, they're creating a world where carbon trading is this distraction, you know, from the real changes that we need to see on the ground. Systems change, the root remedies, these include ends to racism and to societal violence and to inequity and a just transition. So the rights of Mother Earth can shine and that workers and whole communities can make changes and reinvestments and then also be able to fund ourselves and move forward, not just have a silver bullet that's being um, pushed forward to the climate crisis in the GCAS. Uh, governor Jerry Brown, the current governor, he's on his way out the door as the governor. He'll be funded. He'll be taking part in carbon trading schemes in the future. And, and how nice that he's being celebrated as a leader on climate, which in fact, he is actually looking to profit, profit against real solutions. When we were in um, Bonn, Germany for the COP23, a friend of mine, Daniel, with I don't know more. Bay Area uh, stood up and he was talking about keeping in the ground referring to fossil fuels. We have the solution. You don't need to trade carbon if you don't put it into the atmosphere in the first place. And the governor looked at him and he said he was getting irritated as his speech got interrupted by Daniel saying, let's keep it in the ground, governor. I'm, I'm in California. I'm one of your constituents. This is what I'm telling you. And he said, you know what? Why don't we put you in the ground so we can get on with it? That was his reaction to one of his local community members saying, this is what I'm asking for you to do. And this is the reaction to all of us, is business will always seek profit above real climate actions, profits to sell the sky, to sell the people, incarcerate our people. There's all these detention centers now where children are being separated from their families. It reminds me of what happened to our native people during you know, boarding school days. My grandma went to a boarding school and there are pictures of tents being set up outside um, these schools where our children were taken historically and it's happening again in this country, again. Communities such as mine and such as those in the South, we deserve better. We've never done anything to deserve this kind of treatment by these backroom deals. And so I would like to just talk about hemp solutions in North Dakota. We have a lot of flat growing areas. For me specifically, my just transition looks like building earth lodge villages, building small scale solar distribution, which we're starting this summer as part of our just transition project with IEN. We are taking back our power in our communities because we're the only ones that can. Somebody can't sit in a conference in a summit somewhere and say this is gonna solve the climate. No, climate crisis, it, it's us in our communities. So and when we say all these words, it doesn't really mean anything unless you can see us growing our gardens and our communities, feeding ourselves so that we can be truly sovereign, building our ways and learning our culture, learning our language and taking back that which has been taken away from us by colonization, capitalism and this thought that we can go and go and grow without ever ending and so when I talk about having this inside strategy and this outside strategy when it comes to things like the global climate action summit and the soul to soul summit it's that we have to flip it and turn it inside out we're forced to do this if they're not going to let us go on the inside and make it really difficult for us to be on the inside and then offer false solutions on the inside of this meeting that they're gonna have, well then we're gonna have a dual strategy to be able to be in those spaces for the very select few of us that can actually get inside. We're gonna be in there, but we're also gonna have the thousands and thousands more of us that are outside those walls, in the streets, here, making our voices heard on the outside. And that's what It Takes Roots is about.
bringing a voice to those that cannot speak for themselves. We work collectively and together to ensure that our people and all those, the, the plants, the animals, the four-legged, the winged, everybody, those not born yet, our babies that don't have a voice in there that are going to be the most impacted, will have a voice because of people like us, <laughs> because of it takes roots. We get it. We get it. It's not just a fancy slogan. You have to get to the root cause of any problem before you can make it right. That's what we understand as a coalition, but we need that assistance and that guidance in the struggle from people to help resource us up and to help us to continue to move forward. I might have gone over time. I'm sorry, I got a little <laughs> emotional. I want to say matik adads, thank you. Thank you so much, Candy, for that, for that really heartfelt uh, analysis and thinking around our struggles together. I'm going to turn it over to um, our folks who are providing some more examples of, of local solutions on the ground, just like Candy started talking about. And we're gonna hear first from Davin Cardenas, the co-executive director of the North Bay Organizing Project, who's also representing the Right to the City Alliance at the national level. All right, thank you. Um, again, my name is Devin Cardenas. I'm with the Right to the City Network, the Homes for All campaign, as well as the North Bay Organizing Project here in Santa Rosa, California, in Sonoma County. Um, and I think with our, with our alliances, with Right to the City, with Homes for All, we're seeing the clear connection between the housing crisis, the renter crisis, and the climate crisis that's uh, kind of undoing our, our global work. Um, here in the North Bay, you know, we just came out of, of the, the most destructive wildfires in the history of California. Um, and we see a clear connection between not only the, the fact that our state has been in a drought for several years and has been drying itself out, and that creates the conditions um, for, for these, you know, Lake County is burning as we speak right next to us. Uh, and we came out of these wildfires, but, but fortunately we also had the DNA already in our practice uh, to make sure that we, we just turned in signatures for rent control here in Santa Rosa because we understand that um, our ability to remain where we live, where we work, where we thrive, where we live um, is critical to not letting the, the, uh, the, the climate um, capitalists take advantage of these moments to displace uh, our communities. Um, but we also sit at the intersection of uh, not only environmental protections, uh, tenant protections, but also immigrant defense. So as the fires raged, we began the organizing process of rent control, but we also, our immigrant base also established the UNDACA fund to support uh, immigrants with stipends uh, so that they're not displaced after having lost everything. Um, and we had already began the conversations of talking about establishing a rights of nature campaign in our county. Um, so we're, we're, we're very clear that the climate crisis is gonna have its impact, but what's in our DNA is how we're gonna grow this resistance, how we're gonna make sure that, that uh, the people who are fighting for immigrant defense in our community are also gathering signatures for rent control so that we have the right to remain and the right to a roof here in Sonoma County and across the Bay Area. Um, with, uh, with the right to the city, with our homes for all, I think similar to our sister alliances across uh, the country, as part of It Takes Roots, we focus on the needs and the leadership of frontline communities, that our voices are centered in the policy um, but not just in the policy, but in the struggle and our ability to actually develop ourselves as we grow our membership base. We're also growing ourselves as individuals uh, who are learning how to struggle. Um, and the other part is that I think we're also addressing the immediate needs uh, of our base as well as a long term vision. So we're very clear that if we're fighting for rent control here in the city of Santa Rosa or in any given city, um, that's just a battle that we're involved in because we have to respond to immediate needs. But the longer term movement, we are looking at the decommodification of housing on a long term basis. These are steps that we're going to take. You know, we, we, we believe that in 30 years, 40 years, the current crisis that we live in and the renter crisis we live in is going to be an absurdity 
you know, it'll be so absurd for us to look back and be like, wow, we actually exploited people like that because we're going to change the frame of how we think about these things. And that's part of our visionary process in organizing. Um, and the other part of it, that it has to be rooted in the, in the local vision, uh, local creativity, local uniqueness, uh, and local strategy so that we're not um, employing a top-down model for how we take up our struggles, but rather we're looking and understanding what are our local needs and how we're actually going to affect change with our brilliance that we bring on from the local level. Um, the other thing I wanted to just point out that we believe that September is going to be critical, not only because of GCAS, uh, but also this sets the tone for us here, especially like Homes for All California, uh, um, that our, our Homes for All members here in California, our Right to the City members here in California are going to be, it'll set the tone, September will set the tone for what happens in November because many of us, Santa Rosa included, and many cities across California are going to be involved in local tenant protection campaigns that are, that are going to be um, large as well as a statewide uh, campaign to um, to undo uh, anti-tenant protections in the state of California and many of these are policies that came from um, a very racist era in California history in the 90s where Pete Wilson was creating anti-immigrant laws and anti-tenant protection laws and we're actually challenging those as a movement for the first time and we know the opposition is watching, we know the opposition is well funded, but um, how we start building right around from before September into uh, the soul to soul, it'll also set the tone for what comes out and building up towards November. So um, we're very proud to be part of this movement and we think it's a critical moment and we think it's a critical time for us to be sharing these, these stories and these voices. Um, and I am going to pass it to, um, to Daryl, who's also one of our um, allies and comrades here in the Bay Area to talk about what she's doing. Hi everyone, my name is Daryl Molina Sarmiento. I'm the Executive Director of Communities for a Better Environment. Joining you all from Richmond, California right now, though I am based in our Southern California office. Uh, very um, uh, honored to be able to join and be with you all here to talk about some of the work that we've been doing in Southern, in California overall. Um, you know, we're going to be hosting this climate summit, our wonderful governor, Jerry Brown, um, you know, highlighting what he's uh, calling his victory, his solutions about cap and trade. But, you know, CBE, we've been, um, you know, we've been around for 40 years this year. We're celebrating 40 years of resistance. We're grounded in four of the most impacted black and brown communities in California, in Richmond, East Oakland, in Northern California, Wilmington, and Southeast Los Angeles in Southern California, where we see the, the death cycle of fossil fuels impacting our communities. We are, our communities have the highest concentration of oil refineries in Northern and Southern California which is why we've been on the resistance, the front lines of the resistance to cap and trade since it was first passed. Um, Candy talked a lot about cap and trade and um, you know, we definitely know that the failures of this false solution, um, you know, because we have actually seen increases in emissions in our communities as a result, we've seen rampant fossil fuel expansion in California under cap and trade. And as most of you all know, last year, Governor Brown pushed for the extension of the cap and trade program, and we fought really hard against that bill package that ultimately passed this, this fall. And unfortunately, it's going to continue to perpetuate that same impact of oil in our communities, um, weakening, it actually weakened our work in the Bay Area, our local work that we've been pushing for direct emissions reduction rules through refinery caps at our local air districts. So we know because of these examples that these statewide climate policies are false solutions. We continue to see um, the, the growth and we continue to lead the opposition against this rapid fossil fuel infrastructure expansion in our communities. For those of you that haven't been to California that are gonna be coming and joining us, you know, we've been dealing here in Richmond with um, multiple crude by rail um, projects that we were successfully defeated over the last couple of years. Currently, we're dealing with a um, proposed Phillips 66 um, marine terminal expansion that would feed um, Bakken crude into the Bay Area oil refineries, the Tesoro oil ref refinery expansion in Los Angeles that would make it the largest oil refinery complex um, on this side of the nation. 
the billion dollar 710 freeway expansion, reckless neighborhood oil extraction in Los Angeles, transport of crude by rail. We know that this is still continuing even under the system. So we are advancing um, the true solutions that have um, been coming from the ground from our membership, um, advancing a just transition to a regenerative, regenerative economy. Um, some of our local solutions include decommissioning oil refineries to the work that we're doing in the Our Power Coalition in Richmond, applying a just transition framework and also creating policies on the ground. One of the policies that we're working on right now is to put the people at the center of advancing energy policy and developing solar infrastructure and a dem democratically locally controlled um, energy, uh, energy um, commission. We're also pushing for public land policy that would um, put the, the, um, the lands in, back into the hands of the community. And at the heart of all of this is our intergenerational organizing work led by our, our youth program that has been around for over 20, almost 20 years um, in Richmond and in Southern California. These are the folks that are leading it at the heart with theater, with art, um, culturally relevant organizing that's necessary to advance our struggles. And CBE, um, we're part of the People's Climate Movement um, organizing through not directly, but through CEHA, the California Environmental Justice Alliance, which represents us at that table. We've been involved in the planning of the It Takes Root Soul to Soul um, through our Richmond Our Power Coalition and, and participating in those activities leading up to the summit from the direct action camp to the upcoming general assemblies. And we're also gonna be mobilizing a contingent of up to 50 of our members from Southern California to the summit in September to join our folks in NorCal and advance our solution of putting people on the front lines of, 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 um, of solutions and not um, on the front lines of industry. So I will pass it on to Ananda, who's going to continue to um, talk about what's happening on the ground nationally. Thanks, Daryl. Uh, thanks all for being on this uh, webinar. Um, I'll start off by saying uh, the Climate Justice Alliance uh, was formed in 2009 when many of us realized that the voices of uh, the environmental justice movement and uh, groups, other groups organizing communities of color on the front lines of the ecological crisis were not being represented at national and international uh, climate policy arenas. Uh, and we continue to uh, organize to ensure that uh, those voices, uh, the voices of uh, many of the community leaders you've heard today, uh, are held up in these spaces. And as we continue to lift up the thought leadership uh, and democratic voice of our communities, we believe we are facing a moment where civil society and philanthropy are facing some very clear choices to either support the ongoing investments of billions of dollars in corporate climate schemes, as Candy and others have alluded to, brought to us by the very people causing climate change, or shifting those resources to solutions being cultivated by communities whose lives are first and most impacted by this crisis. We believe that the survival of people and planet depend on the kind of place-based knowledge and solutions being cultivated in our backyards, on the ground, in our communities. Uh, because I think that's where I think uh, the stakes I think are, are highest. It's significant uh, that the Global Climate Action Summit is, uh, is being hosted this fall in San Francisco on the occupied ancestral lands of the Ohlone First Nations, a region that has been an epicenter of movement inspiration since the early days of resistance to settler colonialism. Uh, and it's also significant that uh, this is where uh, our social movements may be best positioned to contest what we see as largely a disaster capitalist agenda. Recent movement history, as many of you know, including the free speech movement, the American Indian movement, the Black Panther Party, uh, the environmental justice movement, which uh, you know has some of its early roots uh, in fighting the refineries that Daryl was talking about in Richmond, California and, and neighboring communities, uh, have made the streets of uh, the Bay Area some of the the places, spaces where democratic democratic voice of movements may be currently strongest in the Western Hemisphere. So it's essential that uh, the so Solutions to Solidarity Summit really not only contests what is fundamentally wrong with the way uh, you know a vast majority of uh, civil society investments are still being uh, made towards supporting some of these uh, disaster capitalist agenda and shifting that direction. Uh, and while the Bay Area, like you heard, was home to many of the corporate forces like Chevron, Shell, 
uh, Philip 66, forces that are destroying the earth uh, with one of the largest oil refining complex complexes on the West Coast. It's, uh, it's also not, uh, worth noting that these refineries have an impact that's far broader than California. For example, the Philip 66 refinery is one of the main driving forces behind the Canadian government's efforts to expand the Kinder Morgan pipeline the largest fossil fuel infrastructure project currently in North America, which is planning to double the capacity of tar sands crude oil brought out to the Pacific coast and shipped down via tanker traffic to the Bay Area uh, through the unceded territories of the slave tooth the Squamish and Muskie, I'm here in my backyards, all First Nations, Indigenous nations that are putting up a valiant stand to stop this uh, Canadian government investment. Um, What's significant, however, is that uh, our communities that have been historically fighting these refineries, such as uh, CBE, APEN, and other members of the Richmond Coalition, also the Our Power San Francisco group, led by our sister organization, Poder, have been organizing alternatives, organizing local living and regenerative economies to replace the dig, burn, drive, dump economy that's at the root of this ecological crisis. These community organizations are organizing a deeper, more fundamental change to this extractive economy, where our efforts are aimed not only at decarbonizing this extractive economy, but also detoxifying, degentrifying, demilitarizing, decolonizing, and democratizing these economies. Because fundamentally, we believe that we will never be able to effectively tackle climate change without such complementary and interlinked goals. That replacing the status quo with economies that serve the needs of our communities and workers is ultimately our, our best chance at really staving off the worst of what climate change uh, is bringing us. And that shifting the current agenda and away from the agenda of corporate plunder and profiteering is really our, our sole mandate. Our communities are illustrating how local democratic pathways in energy democracy, food sovereignty, zero waste, housing justice, public transportation and ecosystem restoration are the solutions paths we need to invest in, not the carbon markets and corporate technologies such as clean coal, biomass energy or nuclear power uh, and many other corporate schemes that Jerry Brown's friends are seeking to promote and seeking financing for inside the Global Climate Action Summit. This is a moment, like I said earlier, where we are facing some clear choices and we hope you'll join us in really shifting the attention of our broader movement, but all the investors who are looking at pathways such as clean energy to move their billions of dollars that are going behind these corporate schemes towards solutions being cultivated by communities uh, and people whose lives are first and most impacted. Thank you. Thanks, Ananda, and thank you so much to, to the folks we heard from uh, regarding people's solutions, local solutions that are really working on the ground. So you've heard a lot now about why this work is so critical um, and so I'm going to share with you all what we are really planning to do in September and how that's building off of all of the local work that's already happening. So um, I am going to screen share with you all a, a two-pager that we've put together that, that you'll get after this meeting that outlines exactly the day-by-day -day activities for the Soul to Soul week in September. So I will share that with you right now. And I'll talk through it as well. So you'll see that um, we are planning the work from September 8th to the 14th throughout the Bay Area, but as well as San Francisco, as, as well as Oakland, Richmond, um, where our folks are really doing the work. Um, on the day-to-day -day level, we will be kicking off the activities on Saturday, September 8th with this year's iteration of the People's Climate March, uh, Rise for Climate Jobs and Justice. Uh, you heard from Daryl and from, from other folks that we have a number of local California organizations who are on the California State Table. Uh, and we also have um, representation of It Takes Roots on the national level and the planning body for the, for the People's Climate March uh, across the US. So we're really gonna have our people out in the streets with art and music and uh, really looking at this as an intersectional event, not only for folks who are doing climate justice and environmental justice work, but um, like we heard from Davin, folks were thinking about the intersections of that with migration, with displacement, with militarization, and with all of the forms of, of capitalism that we're looking to combat. And then on the 9th, we're going to take it from like a national style mobilization to really local level work. So on Sunday, September 9th, folks are going to be participating in local tours where they'll be visiting some of the sites that Ananda 
um, and Davin and Daryl mentioned, where they'll be making art together, where, where they'll be learning about direct action skills and preparing and then training up for some direct actions that might be coming up later in the week. Then on Monday, September 10th, we'll be having an internal It Takes Roots member assembly, out of which our folks are really going to come together, align, and solidify our vision for the work, not only for the rest of this year, but up through 2020 and beyond. So we see ourselves coming out of that with a really clear documentation and platform of what It Takes Roots as over 150 member organizations are really coming together around at the national level. Then on Tuesday, September 11th, um, we are going to be having our really biggest event of the week, uh, our public facing event, which we really would love funders and allies and folks throughout the the country and and the world to be coming out to. Um, That's our Solidarity to Solutions Summit or our Soul to Soul Summit. And that's going to be taking place in public space, really reclaiming the land in San Francisco as we are, are working on all of the logistics and thinking of it as like a fair slash a world social forum fuel format. So we'll have lots of conferences and workshop sessions happening out throughout the day. We'll open and close with big plenaries, a really high component of music and art and theater and all the cultural aspects that make our organizing work so, so crucial. Um, And then that will lead us that space of of healing and rejuvenation and, and celebration of people's solutions will lead us into actions around the Global Climate Action Summit from September 12th to the 14th. And those actions are taking shape based on how the negotiations are going with the organizers of the summit and with Jerry Brown and with other folks on the national and international levels. So that's a little bit uh, in motion as we're thinking about what are the most strategic ways for us to work inside the summit as well as outside the summit as Candy talked about. So we're gonna have from the 8th to the 14th, a lot of uh, really big activities. We have organizations at the local level who are already forming a host committee uh, and building up the organizing and uh, the base building to get folks involved and, and really thinking through how can we best support the local organizing so that this week is not just one exciting week of action, but really forms a foundation for changing the narrative around solutions and changing the narrative around justice and equity in our work so that we're even stronger for for many years to come. So I am going to stop the screen share now, but you all will get that document. And now that you've heard a little bit more details about what we're doing during the Soul to Soul week itself, we're going to move into a deeper conversation about how you can get involved. Um, And I'm actually going to invite Farhad Ebrahimi from the founder and president of the Chorus Foundation to share a little bit from a funding perspective of ways to be involved with the work that we're doing as it takes roots in the Soul to Soul week. Can folks hear me okay? Yes. Okay, Okay. awesome. Thank you so much. And uh, big thanks to Shaw in particular for rolling with various uh, technical considerations on my end, because I don't know how well folks can see, but I'm on the street in downtown LA right now. Um, I want to start out by expressing some appreciation from the folks from It Takes Roots. Um, These conversations, I think, have been very helpful for us at Chorus. They're not just about potential support or our participation in the funder support circle for It Takes Roots or anything like that. Uh, They are that and also prompts for us to think about our own engagement in all of this. Um, As a result, the funder support circle has also been a catalyst for our own organizing in philanthropy, um, which I think has been really helpful. And I really appreciate them, um, you know, giving us that catalyst and, and maybe a little prodding to do so. Um, and just want to, you know, flag what may seem obvious, but we don't necessarily uh, think about it all the time, that even philanthropy can have its own inside-outside game. Um, So with that in mind, this is a double invitation. Uh, It's an invitation to support the grassroots organizing sector's response to the opportunity presented by the GCAS, um, but it's also an invitation to participate in all of this ourselves. Um, And so what does that participation look like? I mean, Uh, To put it bluntly, it goes beyond simply attending the events with funder or philanthropy in the title. Um, All these other spaces that have been mentioned are important relationship building spaces. Um, And just to uh, maybe nerd out a little bit about relationships and ecosystems for a moment, um, you know, the strategy to change any system is itself a system. It's uh, in this case a social change ecosystem. 
And, you know, I, I think we all know that ecosystems aren't lists of things, they're webs of relationships. And this is what grassroots organizers do. This is part of the work that, uh, that It Takes Roots folks are doing with all this different programming. Um, and so as funders, we need to be part of the same web of relationships and hence part of the same relationship building spaces. Uh, so showing up as full people isn't just a nice thing to do. Uh, it will also make us more effective at our work. Um, and just to talk a little bit about events like the GCAS, um, I mean, first, and this is really just uh, uh, reiterating and showing as funders that we're listening to what has already been said, um, when powerful people get together to discuss solutions to any problem, we should have a healthy skepticism. Um, and, and healthy skepticism might even be a euphemism in this case. And so we need to make sure that the folks with the most at stake have both a seat at the table and when necessary, a table of their own. Um, you know, GCAS is not an annual conference with uh, established lines of input and accountability. Um, you know, to be blunt, they're kind of making it up as they go along. It's a moving target. And this is a big part of why it's important to both support and participate in an outside game. Uh, the grassroots organizing sector needs to be resourced by funders like us to keep up with a constantly shifting landscape. And as allied funders, we need to be in the mix as well. Um, so here's what we can share already. The reminder of everything is all a moving target. We're figuring it out as it develops. Um, obviously, uh, uh, based on everything I've said so far, at least I hope it'd be obvious, we should be participating in Solidarity Solutions Week. And rather than asking, oh, which events should I come to, which are the ones that are particularly catered to philanthropy, the question should more be, well, which events shouldn't we come to? Which events um, do you wanna make sure that that power dynamic doesn't exist? And for example, I would say, you know, maybe the internal membership assembly might go a little smoother without mysterious funders making folks nervous. But this is a conversation um, that we'll be engaging in. Um, and this is a conversation that we're excited to engage all of y'all in as funders in terms of how can we show up in more ways than just the funder briefings that are taking place in town. Um, we'd also ask that folks stay tuned for a potential orientation to the overall GCAS space for progressive funders. Um, as that agenda develops, we'll be determining the right time and place for such an orientation. Um, but if folks could um, sign up for more info now, and, and I hope somebody on the call can share a little bit more context on how to sign up, uh, we can share that info as we have it. Um, and just overall, I, I think all of this engagement is about our understanding of what's going on from a frontline perspective. What are the implications for communities of what's being proposed at a city, state, or national, or even international level? Um, and what plans and proposals do communities themselves have for all of this? And so I'll just close out with a reminder to support the work. Uh, Maya will be sharing the budgetary needs in just a couple of minutes. Um, I want to encourage folks to pay extra attention to the part where she says this is a long-term strategy. Uh, the GCAS is part of the journey. It's not the destination itself. Um, and, you know, those of you all know me and hear me say this all the time, long-term strategy requires multi-year support from folks like us. So uh, I encourage all of us to not just be thinking about the budget gaps for this particular mobilization, but for It Takes Roots uh, work writ large and long-term. Thanks very much. Thank you, Farhad. Um, that's, that's really, really helpful to be thinking about the ways that we're looking to engage funders in all aspects of the work. And, and on that point, uh, I'm gonna turn it over briefly to Daryl uh, to share a little bit of the local organizing asks. And then, like Farhad said, I will share um, from the national perspective, if it takes roots as an alliance of alliances, what we're, what we're really looking for to make sure we get this work done long-term. Just briefly, you know, our, our local ask is what I spoke to earlier is really supporting the local efforts of the people on the ground, lifting up um, the local grassroots solution. So folks in Richmond and the Our Power Coalition, folks in EJ communities across California and across the U.S. And, um, you know, we're tired of being sacrifice zones. We want to make sure that our leadership is, um, you know, at the helm of these plans. Um, we don't also want to see this end or stop in September. You know, what is the investment? What is the um, plan moving forward beyond, um, you know, this week of action coming together? And I'll pass it back to you, Maya. Awesome. Thanks, Daryl. Um, so 
for us as an alliance of alliances, it's really important that whatever we're taking in as funding is really supporting the local organizing that's happening and is strengthening the work over a course of many years that we're not just a flash in the pan, but that we're really providing a foundation. So to that end, we have so far raised about $1.5 million, both in a combination of one-year grants as well as multi-year grants. Um, but to really get to a healthy place for, for September, we're looking to get to 2 million. So about 500,000 more is really that the place where we're looking for a sweet spot to really be able to support the work of our local organizations and provide um, provide the framework and support that folks need to pull off the Soul to Soul Week in a really, really powerful way. Um, so that's one piece of, of where we're where we're looking to get to, but of course we're also looking beyond September to for three-year, four-year, multi-year grants that are are continually being used to support training and investment and resources for the 150 plus local member organizations that we're supporting and, and working with. And so that's the funding side and of course we're also looking for funders to to do their own organizing and be involved in that way um, and so we've actually created a helpful little form for you on the it takes roots website where you can note the ways in which you want to be engaged both on a funding aspect as well as from an organizing uh, outlook so i'm going to screen share with you again really quickly just so you can see what that page looks like it is at um, sorry, I need to minimize that. It is ittakesroots.org slash soul to soul slash allies. Um, and so there is a form here where you can let us know your contact information, whether you're planning to come out to the soul to soul week or to the GCAS already, whether you're interested in supporting some of the organizing at a national level, um, whether you're interested in financially supporting and, and what that looks like for you, and especially if you'd like to hear more information about the funder orientation piece that Farhad was talking about. Um, so I will drop that into the chat box so that you all have the link as well, um, and we'll be sending it out to you afterwards um, in a packet with the, with the one pager and some few other documents, uh, including the recording. So it's it takes roots.org slash SOL, the number two SOL. Uh, we make it hashtag friendly here, slash allies, and that's plural, A L L I E S. And for those of you who are um, joining via Zoom, you'll see that in the chat box as well. Um, so now we're at the part where I'd love to turn it over to questions from folks. Um, and I, I think that we've been a little slow on questions so far, but if folks have, have questions they want to ask, please feel free to drop it into the chat right now. Um, and I will be working with um, one of my uh, supporters here at one of our partners, um, Ginger, to, to read out your questions and make sure that our presenters can read them and respond to them. So any questions, feel free to drop them into the chat. And folks can also feel free to unmute yourselves and ask, and you should be able to unmute yourself if you're on your phone just by clicking the unmute button, or if you're calling from Zoom, you should be able to unmute yourself on the Zoom interface at the bottom of the screen um, to ask a question. I'm seeing one question coming in right now um, from Diane Ives asking, how does Soul to Soul align with the People's Climate March and 350.org activities at GCAS? And I will open that up to, to folks on the panel to answer, but maybe Cindy, if you'd like to answer, and I can also support in a response. Sure. Um, thanks, Diane, um, for asking that question. So we, um, you know, as, as Maya shared earlier, uh, the Indigenous Environmental Network, the Climate Justice Alliance, and Grassroots Global Justice Alliance are members uh, of the, of the People's Climate um, Mobilization Movement um, uh, Council. It's now called the Council. 
And in fact, we also have a seat at the, what it's called the MST, the Movement Support Team, which is the leadership body of the PCM. And um, for those of you who don't know, I actually, that, that, that was the, the birth of the It Takes Root slogan um, came out as the, the name of the frontline contingent in 2014 um, for uh, the mobilization in September that happened that we helped organize um, here in New York City. And so, so we have been, you know, active members um, in the PCM. And I think as we were uh, trying to uh, make a decision at the PCM level around um, the participation in, in a national mobilization, um, for us was very clear that we had to, you know, we have a lot of base members, um, statewide members in California, and felt that it was very important that, um, that a lot of the, the organizing work, a lot of the campaign work that is there get lifted through the PCM, just like the way it did in 2014 in New York City, uplifting the work of Nija and, and Uprose and in New Jersey and Ironbound. Um, and then the way it did in Washington, D.C. with our and then the DMV area, our local affiliates there. And so our commitment through the PCM process is how do we, you know, mobilize for the march on the 8th. And that's our soul to soul starts then, you know, the mobilization. So we're bringing in mobilizing folks um, started, you know, having them be in the Bay Area by the 7th or the morning of the 8th. So mobilizing that frontline contingent um, with a lot of our sister organizations. And um, we're also doing a, a ton of work um, with bringing in folks um, in the migrant rights um, organizing, in the Black Lives Matter organizing, in the folks that have been doing, like um, you heard, uh, housing and land defense work, and being able to really um, see this as an opportunity that people don't just uh, think about the PCM as, a, as just a climate march, but that we see this as a very clear, integrated way and bring that messaging to um, the lead up of the PCM, but also um, at the day of. But we really see that as the kickstart of our mobilizations and encouraging our partners, um, such as 350 and um, all the other folks, um, the labor, labor organizations, the other uh, Greens um, to participate and support the Soul to Soul Summit. So we've been actually having a series of meetings um, with uh, different uh, representatives in the Bay Area um, of of our um, you know these different sectors that are also represented at the PCM around support and ways that we can help build each other's um, you know work and strategies. Um, I'm going to pass it to Ananda or Maya if you want to say anything much more specific. I think um, you covered it all. Go ahead, Ananda. I, I think you covered it, Cindy. I, th I think uh, maybe something that for folks may recall this, folks may not, that uh, that the People's Climate March was actually originally conceived by members of the Indigenous Environmental Network at a gathering we had in early 2013 in, in the Midwest, where the idea was that we needed to really build a much larger movement uh, capable of the deep systemic change required to tackle climate change, and that that movement needed to be led by communities on the front lines of the ecological crises. So the first conversations in New York during the 2014, uh, for, uh, in the lead up to the People's Climate March, were really convened by IEN, CJA, Grassroots Global Justice Alliance, uh, when we invited uh, folks like NRDC, Sierra Club, and 350 to join us on the streets of New York. So in that context, I think it's a vehicle, but as folks know, and I think Cindy alluded to it, it is, uh, you know, our efforts to really shift the debate to look at what's really needed uh, in this uh, in this critical moment is is something that I think even this webinar or our engagement at the PCM uh, serves us uh, to do in, in the long term. Check. Awesome. Thanks, Ananda. I'm seeing one other question asking about the plans for international participation from social movements in the global south and how our our, our comrades internationally will be linking up with our soul to soul plans and uh, how we'll be building solidarity with global social movements through the soul to soul. So I'm gonna turn it over to, to any of our panelists who, who want to talk a little bit about that. I know there's a lot of plans in the works.
Um, maybe Candy, if you want to start sharing a little bit of the plans from IEN to be linking with indigenous movements uh, throughout the global south. Well, we already have plans for folks that are coming here to the Protecting Mother Earth gathering from the Amazon, from Ecuador. We have Maori folks here. We have Australian folks that are coming. A couple of Mapuche of our relatives from Chile. And we are um, talking about the strategies that we'll have around not only um, the barriers of getting in or being a part of something, but language barriers that exist, for example, and how to be very inclusive for all of us that speak the language of our colonizers and have to like organize in that way, how do we make translation available so that we can communicate uh, with each other as well? Um, uh, so that's a very real scenario. Um, but we do have a lot of sort of ride share things happening. How do we get there uh, driving? You know, how do we um, be cognizant you know, of our own travel and what we're doing? Um, on the ground uh, once we get there uh, and really networking and connecting so that we find the very intentional space during this whole time together in September uh, to sort of say, okay, this is what's happening here. This is what we're going to participate in. How are we being very mindful and attentive to what is happening beyond um, uh, in an international level with all of these um, different carbon trading cap and trade kind of schemes and things they're not just in a in a, in a silo you know they impact all over the world and so it, it's really helping in a popular education format people to understand what those those details and big words really actually mean because it's very easy to come into a community and just dangle money in front of people and say it's going to be great <laughs> and so a lot of our work is just building a really solid foundation around the specific details around what these um, sort of uh, climate uh, solutions that are being put up actually mean and then how we can fight back against them. Thanks, Candy. That's really helpful. And I think one thing that we can share is that um, it takes roots as we're, as we're building out our budget um, a, a part of what we're supporting is making sure that we support the attendance of, of our international comrades to things like the PME and also to the Soul to Soul Week. Um, we'll also be having folks coming out to, to the member convenings for um, Grassroots Global Justice and Right to the City Alliance. So that's definitely a really important piece to us because this work is international. Um, I yeah. see... The only, the only thing, thanks Maya and Ken. The only thing to add is, you know, um, we we're seeing this, you know, those of you who have been following the, the, the cops, the UNF, Triple C, um, you, all, you, you all know that there's always a social movement space that um, movements organize from France to Lima um, to Bonn. And I think that we see this, um, even though it's, a, it's within the context of the United States, and we know that this is going to have global implications. And uh, there's going to be mayors and elected officials from not only all over the United States, but also from around the world that will be present at the GCAS. And so part of what we've been doing is actually um, in, the, in the past uh, six to nine months have been engaging with our social movement allies from the international social movements, as, as Candy said, the indigenous peoples, um, uh, La Via Campesina, the movement against dams, um, you know, Nemo Basi, like just different folks about um, what does this mean? Um, and in terms of, you know, again, the US pulling out of the Paris agreements, and but also what does this mean in terms of what's being put forward as solutions and, the, and those implications? And so we um, have already started organizing um, to bring, to help raise funds, to bring international delegates um, to participate at the people, starting from the 8th at the People's Climate Mobilization. And we've done that since New York City. We've always brought international um, social movement delegates to participate in our activities and to be part of the It Takes Roots internal meeting, but also the summit as speakers and, and participating in the actions and creating spaces in which we're having those conversations, whether it's around geoengineering, um, whether it's around, um, you know, red, the carbon 
me uh, market mechanisms? And more importantly, what is our, uh, how do we make time during that period to really talk about this visionary opposition and strategies that people are advancing? And so I think that um, we are looking, um, we started um, also organizing funders who fund um, their partners uh, internationally to help fund some of their partners that are, that are also our social movement allies. So if folks are interested and in, or can only fund internationally, we have been um, actually, uh, we have a working group to figure out how to be able to support um, international folks being able to come to September. Thank you, Cindy and Candy. Um, I'm seeing one, two other questions. One about the individual kind of grassroots fundraising aspect of the work and, and ways that individuals as well can participate in funding the work that's going on. So that's definitely a really big component of our work, especially when we create spaces for training or for delegations, we're asking, our, our individual members to be reaching out to their network and building out bases in their communities so that we are accountable to our people as well as to the larger scale um, foundation grants that are coming in. Um, and I can also drop the link to our individual fundraising page for folks who want to see it into the chat. It's bit.ly slash it takes or sorry slash ITR 2018 hyphen donate. And I can show you what that screen looks like right here. Um, it's a page that will that goes straight to the It Takes Roots in a grassroots fundraising space. And, and that's a place where we're really, really investing a lot of time and energy as well. And then the last question that I was seeing, um, and sorry, uh, an addition that is written in the chat from Shaw is that people can also write a check to grassroots global justice with it takes roots in the memo um, and send it to I believe 700 sorry 7,000 Carol Ave Suite 200 Tacoma Park Maryland 20912 and that's an address that we can send to you to follow up um, the other question that I'm seeing is for Daryl and Davin, what hopes do both of you have for how, how you can use Soul to Soul to advance the local campaigns that you're working on already? Um, I could start in just saying that it's, it, it's already happening. You know, not only the Soul to Soul convening that we're preparing for, but even in the planning, even in terms of, uh, um, somebody referred earlier to the fact that part of this is just developing our networks of, of commonalities and I think we're already seeing that in the planning in terms of thinking about the art and the culture that we're employing to try to um, run our campaigns on a local basis those are only being strengthened by our networks um, and, and that's that's kind of the key to this regional organizing the statewide organizing and national organizing is that the more we come in together to uh, these these conversations the stronger our uh, campaigns become and, and like I said, uh, the Soul to Soul in September is going to kind of set the basis for our, our November campaigns, um, not only in terms of what they look like, um, but also how they sound, how they feel. And because we're in communication with several other cities, even in the Bay Area, that are working on tenant protections and going into November, um, just like the opposition is having to spread out their resources, we're also starting to share our knowledge from, from what uh, other campaigns are doing. And so we do hope for strong renter protections here in the Bay Area. And for us, that also leads to stronger environmental protections in 2020. Um, but uh, we also think that it's gonna strengthen the push on the statewide repeal of these anti-tenant protections uh, come November. So we're, we're very hopeful. But it, like I said, it's already playing itself out um, even prior to the fall. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we're definitely uh, seeing it as a really strategic opportunity for us to lift up our, our local solutions because there's going to be a lot of media out there, um, you know, in folks from, uh, from all sectors um, that will be able to, you know, that we're going to be, that are going to come to our, our local community. They're going to tour Richmond, and so I think we really... Um, obviously, because it's in our community, we see that as an opportunity to lift up our narratives, our local um, narratives, the you know the real impact, the real impacts that folks can um, see themselves on the ground of these types of.
climate policies and um, the need and the, the beauty of our movement that, that, that I'll be coming together. You know, there's also a lot of labor folks that are, um, you know, part of the PCM process. So, you know, historically, it'll, it, we see it as an opportunity for us to continue to build those relationships that have been strained, um, you know, over the, over the last, um, you know, in this, in doing this work. And, um, and also really as an opportunity for leadership development for our community members to participate in these types of um, international climate discussions and convenings because we don't have that opportunity all the time to send you know folks like our youth member Rosemary to Paris that was able to, you know she was able to participate in that and so this also just gives us an opportunity to um, you know, really localize um, how our, our local struggles are having these global impacts and our members will be able to grow, um, you know, in that process and really lifting up, um, you know, their voices and their leadership of the local solutions that we've been advancing. Awesome. Thanks, Daryl and Davin. Um, I'm, I'm seeing that we've answered the majority of the questions that are coming through on the chat. So I, I will take a slight pause to see if there's any burning questions that folks on the phone want to unmute themselves and ask. Cool. Well, we're really, really happy that all of you could have could join this call. And um, my understanding is that we have all of your contact information because you registered to get the Zoom information. But if you have other folks that, that you want to let know about how they can get engaged or you want to make sure that you get more information about the funder orientation to the GCAS down the line, please make sure that you sign up at ittakesroots.org slash soul, S-O-L, the letter, the number two, SOL slash allies. Um, and we will be following up with this call with an email package of next steps uh, and ways that you can continue to engage to, to really support people's solutions that are coming from frontline communities who have place-based knowledge of what we need. Um, and with that, I'm gonna close this out. Thank you again. And we hope to see many of you in September and hopefully much sooner than that as well. Okay. Bye, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thank you Bye. for joining us on this day. Thank you. Thank you.